please help us all give a great big Mile High City kind of welcome, Dr. Jill Stein. Woo! You are beautiful. This is what democracy looks like. We're here to say no more, no how. We are standing our ground for an America and a world that actually works for all of us, not just for the bankers and for the billionaires. This is gonna work for all of us. And it's so awesome to be here in Colorado where you are leading the charge in so many ways, starting with marijuana legalization a few years back. And now on this Amendment 69, you are moving us forward. And thank you for that. And by the way, Amendment 69 shows why we also need improved Medicare for all at the national level. And Colorado is kind of ground zero on fracking, and this is where we stop fracking. And I want to shout out to Boulder, Lafayette, Longmount, Fort Collins, and Broomfield for really leading the way and for banning and putting moratoriums on this dangerous and poisonous practice. I don't, I don't know about you, but I totally don't understand people like Hillary Clinton's new director of transition, Ken Salazar, who says that fracking never hurt anybody. He does not know what he's talking about. Fracking is a very dangerous practice that pollutes our water, that depletes our water supplies in addition, that pollutes our air, that puts communities at risk, that endangers the workers, above all, on the front lines who take their lives in their hands when they walk onto the frac site. In fact, any worker in the fossil fuel industry actually increases their risk of dying on the job by 700% the minute they get onto that job site. So this is for the workers, as well as for the communities. And to all those who are dependent on this fossil fuel money and this fossil fuel economy, we say, we put you first in the just transition to ensure that you will have equivalent jobs, equivalent pay, and equivalent benefits during this transition. And this transition, which you in Colorado are playing such an important role in, let me just say that the eyes of the world are on you and the hearts of the world are so grateful to you for doing this very hard work where you have been leading the way to actually stand up for our right to health, our right to protect our communities, our neighborhoods, and our water supplies. And I wanna thank you for having stood up and said no to fracking. You are the model for the nation. You were certainly the model for New York State that followed in your footsteps by banning fracking throughout the state. So you're leading the way on what we must do nationally. And again, for the $12 minimum wage, it's a start. It's better than we are. We need to move to 15 an hour minimum wage, but I still applaud you for making a big step forward with the $12 minimum wage. Thank you for that as well. And let me just add what the president could do right now. Right now, the president could actually increase that federal minimum wage for all federal workers employed under federal contract. This would pay for itself by improving 
performance. We know that workers do better on the job when they are well paid, decently paid, because 15 an hour just barely gets you to the poverty level. But there will be less turnover, fewer transitions. So this actually pays for itself, and it stimulates the economy. It produces a greater demand from below. This is exactly what we need to benefit our economy. 15 an hour, not just for federal workers, for all workers. And, and these are exactly the things that we need to do at the national level. So, you know, we have right now a state of emergency. We have several states of emergency. One of them is on the climate. Another one is on the economy. And another one falls square on the heads um, of communities of color. We have a crisis of racism and of uh, racial disparities and police violence. And again, a big thank you to all of those here in Colorado that are fighting to end police violence. To be clear, we call for every community to have a police review board with the power of subpoena so that communities control their police, not the other way around. And we also call for investigators, which are independent from the police forces and their local attorneys generals um, and, and their local district attorneys, so that every case of death at the hands of police gets an investigation. Every victim deserves a full accounting. The families deserve a full accounting. Society deserves that accounting. And we also go further. We call actually for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a national commission which will create a series of conversations. We need to have a real healing conversation about race, about xenophobia, about anti-Muslim uh, bias, about LGBTQ bias, we need to have an honest accounting and sharing of the role that prejudice, violence, and hate is playing in dividing our society, especially after this latest election with the hate mongering that's been going on. We need this national commission. This national commission calls for breaking it down and having community facilitated conversations that enable us to bring our stories, our history, our narrative together, along with uh, art and music, to help us understand where we're coming from, to help us, to help everyone understand the historic burden, this legacy of the criminal institution of slavery. Because even though we had the Emancipation Proclamation, which supposedly ended slavery, we all know what came after that. Lynchings came after that, and then Jim Crow came after that, and then segregation, and then redlining of communities, and then the war on drugs, which has been a war against black and brown communities. <laughs> then the institution of mass incarceration followed that, and police violence. And we know that this violence was not new. What's new is the video cameras on our cell phones. We have a very entrenched legacy of uh, racism in the country uh, from this institution of slavery that we were founded on. So we call for this national conversation. And I'm very grateful to my running mate, Ajamu Baraka, who, as a person coming in the uh, tradition of the African-American uh, intellectuals has just an incredible grasp of history, an incredible grasp of human rights and of racial justice, and brings to this conversation voices that have never been heard. I don't know if people had a chance to catch us on CNN two weeks ago. It was like an uninterrupted 90 minutes of everything that you cannot say on primetime TV. <laughs> They asked some tough questions, and we gave them some very tough answers. 
And yes, Ajamu uses some very frank language. <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who use very frank language. <laughs> and they need to be a part of this conversation too. And you know, that's how we ensure that this really will be a truly uh, productive and transformative, unprecedented conversation, a healing conversation about race and divisiveness and violence that will enable us to get past this divisive history, to really share who we are as human beings, to find our common humanity and to move forward. And I'm very grateful to Ajamu Baraka who really, uh, emanates that common humanity in just an incredible way. So I want to give him, again, a big thank you. Another, another forbidden conversation that we are going to have as a part of this is a discussion about reparations. We support reparations because there's been a cumulative burden, uh, which is economic as well as educational health uh, in the realm of justice, you name it, in housing, across all sectors of society. There has been a cumulative burden, and that burden needs to be lifted. We need to be made whole as a society. So we will move forward with that discussion. Here's another uh, forbidden subject, <laughs> uh, and that is that we are all immigrants in this country. Some people have a very short-term memory, but they seem to have forgotten that all of us, with the exception of Native Americans, whose land we stole, and I apologize for this, um, and with the exception of African Americans, who did not have a choice, who were really dragged here, uh, all the rest of us who look like me are immigrants on this bus. Um, and in my view of American exceptionalism, what's exceptional about America is that we have come from all corners of the earth and we have come together to discover our common humanity. That is what is exceptional. It grows right out of our immigrant heritage. So we need to respect, honor, and celebrate our current immigrant community by providing a welcoming path to citizenship for the immigrants who are key to our society. And here's maybe the forbidden part of this, is to recognize that in order to fix this crisis of immigration, the most important thing we can do is to stop causing it in the first place. So to kind of oversimplify it, it would be to say, we don't need no friggin' wall. We just have to stop invading other countries. That would go a long way for starters. Where are the immigrants coming from? After all, from Latin America, most recently from Honduras. And who do we have to thank for the crisis in Honduras? Well, big... Hillary Clinton gave the thumbs up to this corporate coup that has driven tens of thousands of people running for their lives, and when they come here, we criminalize them, people who are refugees, because of these outrageous, inhumane policies that have been allowed to be adopted in the first place. And it's not just Honduras, it's also Guatemala and the legacy of US CIA intervention on behalf of United Fruit uh, many decades ago that led to this legacy, this long-standing many generations of violence in Guatemala and in El Salvador as well. These have been US interventions against essentially democracies, uh, democratically elected governments, which are illegal, unacceptable, immoral. That is exactly what we need to stop. We also need to stop 
the terrible, destabilizing, rigged corporate trade agreements. They are not free trade agreements. They are foul trade agreements. They have hurt workers in our country, and they hurt working people overseas and south of the border. We put millions of Mexican farmers out of business, as well as factory workers, through the dumping of cheap agricultural and manufactured goods uh, in, in Mexico and south of the border. So we need to go back to the drawing boards on NAFTA and create a fair trade agreement, not a free trade agreement. And And we must also stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We must not allow this NAFTA on steroids to be passed, especially during a lame duck session. And you will see us begin to mobilize as we move forward in the campaign to actually help lift up and build the resistance to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So thank you for your work helping to stop the TPP. And, you know, the, uh, the issue of war <laughs> is inseparable from the issue of migration. We have something like 65 million refugees worldwide now. It's tearing apart Europe and the Middle East, for sure. And what are they fleeing from? For the most part, they are fleeing from these disastrous wars that the U.S. has been a major force in, the moving force in these wars. So we call for uh, a completely new chapter in foreign policy. We want to go back to the drawing boards and abandon this foreign policy that's based on economic and military domination and instead create a foreign policy based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. <laughs> These wars have been a catastrophic failure, not just a failure, but an absolutely catastrophic failure just Iraq and Afghanistan alone have cost us $6 trillion when you include the costs of providing health care for our wounded veterans. And we need to provide better health care and better care all around for our veterans. That goes without saying. But these costs amount to six trillion dollars by the time the bills have all been paid. And some of them are still forthcoming, of course. But do you know what that comes to for every American household, for just Iraq and Afghanistan? Six trillion dollars divided up across America comes down to $50,000 for everybody's household here that you have put into those two wars alone. Think about what you might have done with that. What do we have to show for it, exactly? Failed states, mass refugee migrations, and worse terrorist threats. They're not getting better, they're getting worse. This is one of the many reasons why our voices need to be in the presidential debates. Because more of this catastrophically failed policy cannot possibly withstand the light of day. The only reason they can keep hammering away, and this is both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, the only reason they can keep talking about more and bigger militaries that are gonna make us more and more powerful and more and more dominant around the world, the only reason they can talk about that is if they turned a completely blind eye to the actual historical record. This is a massive failure and it is bankrupting our budget. Hillary Clinton, wants a no-fly zone. That's her solution to Syria, which essentially means an air war with another nuclear-armed power, that is Russia. We already have 2,000 nuclear weapons on hair-trigger alert, and we want to be starting an air war with Russia? I don't think so. And Donald Trump, he tells us he's got the great solution, he just won't tell us what it is. One can only imagine, you know, in our worst nightmares. 
This is not what we need. And it's important to look at the track record here. What created ISIS to start with? ISIS grew out of the catastrophe of Iraq and Libya. And, and, you know, and where did Al-Qaeda come from? Al-Qaeda actually came from Afghanistan, where it was this great idea of the CIA and the um, Saudi Arabia to start this, this great global jihadi movement uh, which was going to help the Mujahideen disrupt the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Well, guess what? That great idea has come back to bite us in a big way. We cannot. We and our allies, the Saudis and the other Gulf Coast countries, we cannot simultaneously fight terrorism with one hand, and in the other hand, we fund terrorism, we arm terrorism, and we train terrorism. That is what we have been doing since the Mujahideen. We may say, oh, but these are good terrorists, but tomorrow and yesterday, they weren't good terrorists. It's not like you become a card-carrying member of one terrorist group. They are constantly morphing from one group to another. We should not be in the business of arming, supplying, and fanning the flames of terrorist uh, extremism around the world, which ultimately derives uh, you know, from this Saudi concept, this very violent Saudi concept of Wahhabism. Hillary Clinton herself, in a State Department memo that got leaked, said that the Saudis still, long after 9-11, the Saudis are still the major funder and supporter of worldwide Sunni terrorist movements. We need to get very serious with our allies and with ourselves, of course, because we are also a part of this problem. But we need to be clear that we have a new solution, a new offensive for the Middle East it's called a peace offensive in the Middle East. And it starts, it starts with a weapons embargo. Instead of supplying all sides with weapons, we have been the major funder, certainly in the Middle East and all around the world, the major supplier of weapons. This is not benefiting the Middle East. It's not benefiting democracy. It's not benefiting stability. The only entity it's benefiting are the war profiteers and the weapons industries who are defining our foreign policy. It's time to get them out of the business of writing our foreign policy. These wars are not making us more secure. They are making us less secure at the same time that they are bankrupting our budget. And it's not only the $6 trillion, it's the fact that almost 55% of our discretionary budget is now being spent on the military. Does anybody know what the next biggest line item is? The next biggest size. So 55% is the military. The next biggest size is seven, seven percent. Okay, so we have a budget that's 55 percent military and then there's a whole bunch of little footnotes at seven percent around that. We basically have a military budget. We are being extorted. We are being taken over by that military industrial security complex that President Eisenhower warned us about so long ago. It's time to get them out of the business of running our country. And as we do that, we can uh, cut the military budget, which doesn't make us more secure. Things like the F-35 weapon system that will cost us a trillion and a half dollars by the time it's done, and it is already obsolete, actually, but you know, it's a good jobs program. Well, we're calling for a different kind of jobs program, a green jobs program as part of the Green New Deal. So the Green New Deal will create 20 million good wage jobs to solve our jobs emergency. We do have an economic emergency because the jobs that came back are part-time, low-wage, insecure, and temporary jobs. We need good jobs in this country. And we need a productive economy that's actually producing things that we need, not just sending those jobs overseas. This is our answer to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is how we boost the economy, through a Green New Deal. 
it's not rocket science. This is not something that's hypothetical that we're just inventing. This was actually done during the Great Depression. We actually created millions of jobs within months. We're calling for 20 million jobs over the first term of four years. And those jobs are not just plain old jobs. They are jobs to solve our other emergency, the emergency of the climate crisis that we must start to solve now. We can do that, and we must do that. You have to be like, you know, wearing your blinders if you didn't understand what's been happening over the last couple of weeks with these wildfires all up and down the West Coast, from California to Washington, and, and uh, disaster zones being declared, and over 100,000 people having to flee for their lives from these fire zones. And then down in southern Louisiana, you have a whole new set of floods, again, displacing close to 100,000 people who have filed for a for their homes that have been damaged or destroyed. And then the very next day, what does Washington, the White House do? They open up 25 million acres of the Gulf for new oil exploration. We need to shut that down. No new oil exploration is what we need. As part of that Green New Deal, we call for 100% wind, water, and sun by 2030. <laughs> this is an emergency mobilization because what we're seeing, not only, you know, every month now is setting a new world record for the month of that name. And what we're hearing from the scientists now is that we can expect nine feet of sea level rise as soon as 2050. This is not something we can survive. This is goodbye Manhattan, it's goodbye to the state of Florida, goodbye to the country of Bangladesh, and goodbye to all coastal population centers all around the world. This is not something we want to have to deal with. We've got to stop this before it becomes inevitable. That means today we start to fight this. This means that on the day we turn the White House into a greenhouse, the only responsible thing to do is to declare an immediate moratorium on all new fossil fuel infrastructure. No new fracking, no new offshore oil, no new excavation on public lands. This means no opening up the Arctic, no new frack towers. Instead, right, no pipelines, no fracking pipelines, no oil pipelines, no new oil or fossil fuel pipelines whatsoever. <laughs> Building that infrastructure commits us to another 30, even 40 years of deadly fossil fuel energy. We may not be around in 40 years to use that fossil fuel energy if we continue on the course. And that's what Jim Hansen told us about two years ago with his cutting edge study. That's what this latest study that will be revealed by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that they briefly described at this recent uh, insurance industry conference. But they'll be putting out the written reports about this, that we do not have a future. The only future we have is a green, sustainable, healthy, and just future. That is the future we are making a beeline towards. That Green New Deal revives our economy. It turns the tide on climate change in an emergency way, with an emergency wartime scale mobilization against our true greatest common world threat, and that is climate change. The other thing that the Green New Deal does, aside from fixing our economy, fixing the climate, it makes the friggin' wars for oil obsolete. Because when you have 100% clean renewable energy, and that means no nuclear energy as well, 
<laughs> because it's dangerous and, and there's no place to put it. We can't afford it. It can only survive if it gets huge public subsidies. So, you know, if it weren't being supported by its apologists in our go government, it could not survive left to a free market. It would actually die its own quick, natural death, which is what it should do. We say goodbye and good riddance to nuclear energy. We don't need it. We have all the clean renewables that we need right now. But, you know, the, the whole excuse for the military, we are the only nation, not only right now, but throughout history, that has had armed forces all over the world. Something like, what is it, 700 bases? Nobody knows exactly in over 100 countries around the world. We are safeguarding our access to fuel supplies and to their routes of transportation. So if you add up all the other foreign bases that other countries have, I'm told it comes to like 30, okay? They've got 30 and we have maybe near 1,000. What's wrong with this picture, you know? This is just not sustainable. This is an empire on its way to collapse if we may try to maintain this kind of global military force, it's just not working, it's failing madly, and it really brings out um, you know, all the resistance to an occupying force, which is what many of these military uh, centers become. So the Green New Deal is a very quick, uh, expedited path to a world that has a healthy economy. Not only should we demilitarize, we need to bring our not only our allies, but also our adversaries into this new world order where we put our resources into fighting our true common enemy of climate change, not fighting each other for the things that create climate change, that is fossil fuels. So this is kind of a win-win-win, and the last thing I didn't mention, this pays for itself not only in reduced military expenditures, but it turns out we get so much healthier when we eliminate fossil fuels, that our health savings alone is enough to pay the cost of the green energy transition. So what's not to love about this? When they say we can't afford it, it's actually the opposite. We can't afford not to do it. And it's not only cleaning up our energy supply, it's also transforming our food supply to a healthy, sustainable, relocalized, organic food system instead of this industrial, toxic, uh, mechanized, uh, nutritionally depleted food system that's being subsidized, inflicted on us, and making us sick. So we're calling for jobs also in the healthy food sector, in creating family farms and community farms and farming cooperatives again, bringing back a healthy farming economy. And one last area of jobs that we especially will encourage in the Green New Deal, and that is jobs creating a healthy, renewably powered public transportation system. And it's a public transportation system that also includes recreational transportation. That means safe bike paths and safe sidewalks so we can get to the transit hubs under our own muscle power, having fun while we get there. Uh, an improved Medicare for All system will not cost us more money. It actually just redirects the money that's being wasted right now on paper pushing and bureaucracy and, and exorbitant CEO salaries and instead puts that money, healthcare dollars, into real healthcare. We have a right to healthcare as a human right and we have it now. One last thing I wanna mention that also needs to be done at the national level. And this is something else that will not be discussed unless we are in the debates. We have a generational crisis right now, an entire generation of young people who've been locked into predatory student loan debt. We found a way to bail out the bankers who crashed the economy with their waste, fraud, and abuse on Wall Street. If we could bail out 
the crooks on Wall Street, it's time to bail out their students, the young people locked into predatory student loan debt. It's just a small fraction of the amount of money that was put into the Wall Street bailout, which was something like $16 trillion. So for to bail out a generation of young people, it's about 1.3 trillion. It's much smaller. There are, there are many ways that this can be done, but the important thing is that this is a priority. This is the stimulus package of our dreams to unleash an entire generation of young people. They're already trained. They already went to school. They got their degrees. They need to be liberated to found, to create the nonprofits the worker cooperatives, the, um, uh, the small entrepreneurs. They need to be unleashed to create the economy of the future for all of our benefit. This isn't just for them. This is for all of us. We need them to be liberated to lead the way forward. We can have an America and a world that works for all of us, and we can actually afford it. We cannot afford to continue down this absolutely catastrophic trajectory that we're on. We've got to do it. And the only reason we're not doing it is because the predators still have their hands on the steering wheel through these two corporate political parties who are funded by the predatory banks and the fossil fuel giants, the war profiteers and the insurance companies. We need to establish the alternative to these corporate parties. That's what we are doing in our campaign. You know, who are the, the uh, party professionals and the uh, political pundits? Who are you to be telling the American people in an election where we have rejected these two corporate candidates, the most disliked and distrusted candidates in history, there's unprecedented clamoring for a new political voice, and they're saying, um, how in the world can you possibly get the word out? I thought it was the job of the press to actually educate and empower our citizens. Do your job. Do your job. If you're not doing that, you're not the press. You are the oppress and the repress and the depress. That's not what we need. We need a real press that is serving the cause of democracy. The cause of democracy must be served by open and inclusive debates. Right now, we have this sham of a debate commission. They are not really a debate commission. They are a private corporation run by the Democratic and Republican parties. That is what this Commission on Presidential Debates is. And their job is to create rules that silence political opposition. That is not democracy, that is tyranny. They have created this 15% rule that you've gotta be at 15%, but you know, it's a great catch 22, because they won't cover you until you're at 15%. So this basically locks out any opportunity for change at a time when our lives depend on change. We're not gonna get out of here alive unless we do have deep systemic change and end systemic racism, end this economy for the billionaires, put an end to the crashing of the climate and endless war. We must have this change, so we say, the American people not only have a right to vote, we have a right to know who we can vote for. That should be the criteria for getting into the debate. If a candidate is on the ballot for enough voters that the candidate could actually numerically win the office of the presidency, then voters deserve to be informed about that candidate. Right now, if that rule was applied, there would be four candidates in this debate. In the last election, my running mate at that time, Sherry Honkala and I, were both arrested at Hofstra University, simply trying to get into the grounds of the college to listen to the debate and bear witness to the fact that we should have been in the debate. We were on the ballot for 85% of voters. This time it's gonna be more like 95 or 98% of voters. Those voters have a right to know. So we were all there for just like really the wrong reasons, really political prisoners. We were there tightly handcuffed to these chairs, surrounded by 16 Secret Service and um, Homeland Security and 
and uh, Secret Service people, like, that we were so dangerous. You know, I was like, I felt so honored, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Boy, did I feel powerful. Um, because they were that scared of word getting out, of press finding out that there were actually other candidates to inform the American public about. If you feel like your future is at stake, and that democracy has something to do with your future, and that an open debate has something to do with democracy, I urge you to go to our website, jill2016.com, or go to our social media, Dr. Jill Stein, and that's DR, no period, Jill Stein, and join our campaign for open debates. We will be undertaking actions, including showing up. This is an America and a world that works for all of us. They tell us we are powerless, but in the words of Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. If you just take the number of people who are struggling in student debt, that is 43 million people. They don't want you to know that that 43 million people alone can win this election if we mobilize and come out. That is a winning plurality of the vote in a three-way race. People say, you're going to split the vote. Well, you know what? We don't have to split the vote. We can flip the vote. The president, as it turns out, appoints the Federal Reserve, including the chair of the Federal Reserve. The president can certainly appoint the right people to be sure that we do for a generation of young people what we did for Wall Street. We do have the numbers. We do have the solution. The key is flicking that switch in our own brains from powerlessness, this poison that we have been propagandized with, to flick it from powerless to powerful. This is a revolutionary moment. We have truly unprecedented revolutionary potential. We say forget the propaganda of the lesser evil. Fight for the greater good like our lives depend on it because they do. We have the power. We have the power that we need to create an America and a world that works for all of us, that puts people, planet, and peace over profit. The power to create that world is not just in our hopes, it's not just in our dreams, right here and now, in Colorado, in the United States of America, that power is in our hands. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you so much. It's NAFTA, it is the evil that we don't speak, NAFTA. It takes the strong and it makes them weak, NAFTA. Free market oppression, NAFTA. It feeds a global recession. How else could they deny the fact that of indigenous people with immense knowledge that remains intact, and even though Mayan stories of creation may be hard for some to believe there will be no doubt that I would be made from maize, corn, harvested with the genius of our ancestors and the primary food for most native people for so long. The only thing that we need to point to to say, we belong. Ara Cruz! Well, um